Another extremely interesting panel on, on DLD, which is about search and the future of search. If you look at it closely, you have the feeling that um, Google is the internet. And we have um, Ben Gomez here, one of the, let's say, chief architects of the core search features at Google since 1999, as, as far as I remember. So, um, and you will show us in a, in a few seconds what you are doing uh, at Google at the moment about your actual work for some minutes. Um, we have also here Konrad Wolfram from Wolfram Alpha and recently started not search engine, but it's like something like, an, I'm sorry to say that, answering machine or something like that. Knowledge engine. Knowledge engine. engine thank you. So we, you will show us later the, the concept of, of this knowledge engine. Um, Blaise, you, you have to say your name by yourself. Aguera y Arcas. Blaise Aguera y Arcas. Again, please. Blaise Aguera y Arcas. Wonderful. Thank you. He's working for Bing, and I got to know you two years ago, but just virtually, because you had the, the most downloaded talk on TED. I think that's true until today. Um, you used to, um, you, you, you're, um, uh, are the architect of a famous software called Sea Dragon, which um, lets you zoom into huge sets of data, which, which looks really astonishing. But then Microsoft bought you, and now you're one of the chief architects of Bing, a very successful new little startup of Microsoft, having something like 10% market share at the moment. You will also show us later something uh, about your work. And this is Ilya, one of the co-founders of Yandex, I think the, I think number five or six in the Comscore global search chart. Seven. Oh, sorry, I, it's seven. Uh, number seven, but one of the biggest um, non-English websites on this planet. Uh, I think the German public at least isn't aware of Yandex because it's you know in, not in our language, it's not in English, but it's a really huge player, um, like also some Chinese um, search engines, and we will talk later about all these niches that seem to grow where Google isn't uh, that successful. So maybe you, you want to show us first what you're doing at the moment at Google. You had a major relaunch of the core search surface these days. Uh, nobody realized, I hope, because that's your business at the end, isn't it? Yeah, so uh, I've worked on all parts of search at Google, starting with like crawling and indexing and uh, Going up now, I mostly work on the. I'm the lead on the engineer on the search features, and there's a lot of fancy things that we have uh, launched at Google recently, like uh, real-time search and social search and all those sorts of things. But I think those are kind of the tip of the iceberg. A lot of the core part of what we do is actually making search kind of work better on a from day to day to day. We've launched like 500 changes in the last year, and. It makes searches work better transparently almost for you. So I have a few examples here that I wanted to show. Uh, and one of my favorite things is the way we handle synonymization. It seems like it's a simple problem. And I, I got these examples from our, our synonymization lead, who's German. I don't speak any German, so forgive my pronunciation. Uh, but this is Kreisparkasse GG. And in this context, GG expands to Grossgerau. On the other hand, if you say inhalt GG, which I understand is about the constitution, the, the contents of the constitution, GG in that context means gr gr the, the constitution. I'm not going to try and say it. <laughs> so um, that sort of stuff is extremely hard to get right. You can, yeah, and, and we've made a lot of progress starting uh, many years ago in getting this more and more sophisticated system that just sort of transparently works better for you with almost no, nothing that you notice. Something that you notice a little bit more uh, is our use of translation. Our translation feature has gotten extremely good usage in the last year. It's gone from tens to hundreds of millions of usage. And so now suppose you're in France and you're searching for the geology of Spain. You might imagine that there are actually good documents in Spanish and in English on the geology of Spain. We'll first show you the documents that we believe you'll understand best, the ones that are in French, but we'll now provide you with a link at the bottom that'll show you translated results that are results from English as well as from Spanish, I believe, in, uh, and you can actually add more languages in here for, the, for, uh, uh, for your results. And we translate the snippets as well as the title, so you can get a sense of what these documents are about, how important they are, and whether you want to look at them. Um, 
the, another feature that I kind of like is that is a little bit more visible is Suggest. And I think almost everybody uses Suggest. A large fraction of our queries come in through the auto Suggest. What you may not realize is that the Suggest is different in different countries. If I type in liver in the United States, it's about liver disease. If I type in liver in England, it's about Liverpool. <laughs> if I type in AT in the United States, it's about, uh, it's in, in the Maldives, it's about the, the Maldives at all. And if I type it in the United States, it's about, it's, about, um, it's about atomic weights and so on. One of my tabs is missing. Uh, so you can see we pay attention even to the smallest countries like the Maldives, as well as the biggest countries like Germany and Japan and so on. Uh, and one of my, th but some things are common across the world. Like when I was growing up in India, Merck, was synonymous with the sponsor of this conference, one of the sponsors of this conference in Mercedes-Benz. And that's true pretty much everywhere in the world. It's the same thing is true in Britain. It's true in the States. It's true in Ireland. But it's not true in Japan. In Japan, it's mercurial. So the company has a little bit further to go there. But these are things that are kind of a little bit behind the scenes but they help you on a daily basis making your search better. These are not the most visible things. Those are what you see most in the press announcements and so on. But this is what we spend a lot of our time doing. Thank you for this, this first introduction to your work. Um, so I have the feeling that uh, a lot of searches these days are not anymore about you know, retrieving documents about a special topic, but about getting the answer. And you see like uh, Google is going that direction. If you, for example, in the US type in uh, whether um, uh, New York, you get in the search box you see here, or you have seen here, um, you get the, the weather info. And on the other end of this development, maybe is, is Wolfram Alpha, which is not about search at all or retrieving, retrieving documents, uh, but it's about uh, getting the right answer out of huge data sets. And you wanted to show us some, something, and you need an English you keyboard, and you borrow it from Blaze, and we have to switch computers now. We, we thought we'd minimize the number of computer changes, so I said I would borrow Blaze's uh, computer here and uh, hopefully show you a few things. So Wolf from Alpha is doing something fundamentally different from search. That's why we call it a knowledge engine. What we're trying to do is suck in and curate knowledge and systematic knowledge and data. Uh, and from the other end, we're trying to linguistically understand what it is you're typing in and compute between the two. So everything when I show you, you see with Wolfram Alpha is a live computation done in a cloud and then sent back, formatted and sent back live to the, to the web page. So hopefully I can show you a, a few examples of this. And uh, okay, well, uh, so people ask, uh, we're a company that's gone uh, 23 years, uh, 23 years old making math software, and people ask, how the hell did we get into making a knowledge engine? Well, I'll show you there's actually a lot of math in, in doing this kind of thing. And uh, if I go here to the, the Wolfram toolbar, I'll show you some simple examples. Hopefully these, uh, these work as well. So I could do, let's say, uh, Microsoft versus... No sound. Uh, I could do Microsoft versus Google. And hopefully uh, we go off and we get some comparison between uh, Microsoft and Google. Uh, and uh, we see uh, some parameters that it's picked out and formatted direct and see some comparison between those. So that's a typical thing uh, you, you might do. You might also do something a bit more linguistic. You might ask, uh, for example, for breakfast, I think I had an egg, uh, let's say, plus uh, bacon, etc. And uh, if I enter that, we can see uh, how much running around I have to do today to burn off what, uh, what I ate this morning. So again, this is a live computation. And you see, a little bit like the contextualization that, uh, that Ben was showing, we have a way of choosing different kinds of egg, whether it's an omelet or a poached egg or a scrambled egg, disambiguating the different kinds of things you might, uh, you might want. Well, another thing you might do is uh, ask some question like, uh, what was the weather, uh, let's say, in, in Berlin um, when Angela Merkel was born or something? Munich. Uh, when uh, Merkel was born, if I can spell this correctly, or even not. Perfect. 
Let's see what we get. Uh, let's see if uh, we can uh, figure that out. Wow. And uh, she was born on the, in, and it wow. was apparently uh, overcast, cloudy, few clouds. <laughs> Actually, I have to say, when I do this in the UK with Gordon Brown, and it comes out as drizzly and miserable, <laughs> that works even better. So, of course, we can also do kind of uh, straight math, which to us is very obvious. As I was starting to say, you know, for years we've built uh, maths software. So, you know, to be able to do things uh, and, uh, it's, uh, you know, like uh, I'll do something very simple here, but uh, let's say uh, integrate a sine of x times cos x. You can do much harder things, of course. It's, uh, it's very easy to be able to do that for us. And uh, so people, when people ask, well, how did we come from a math company to a Wolfram Alpha? We're really mixing high power computation that we've built up over our company, which has gone for 23 years building our Mathematica software. And we've now applied it to systematic knowledge, which we're curating in this new process. And there are many different ways that uh, this will be monetized. So one is partnering. We, we already have some partnership with, with Bing started, but we have many others coming. Um, and also, the real thing that's, uh, that's uh, driving interest at the moment is applying this technique to people's, uh, to corporates or government's internal information, private information, to get kind of drive-by answers. So this is a key new direction that really hasn't been possible before in practical terms, and, and Wolfram Alpha is, uh, is a, a good way to do that. Um, so really, uh, in a sense, we're the place where computation, high-powered computation, and knowledge meet at an exciting time when we're sort of in a new era of, of computation where it's kind of getting democratized across everyone. With automation of computers, we'll be able to do this high-powered computation and really apply it to, to their real problems. Thanks. Thank you. So, uh, as you mentioned before, Bing already got a license of Wolfram Alpha. I'm not sure if, if Google got one or... No. So. Um, and it's, it's all about getting the right answer immediately, not about search that much anymore. And I have the feeling that your philosophy from start has been to getting the immediate answer, anticipating what I'm trying to, to ask and find the, the, the right answer. Maybe you show us something about your work at Bing, which is, as I mentioned before, quite successful. Sure. So I, I'm going to focus uh, in particular on Bing Maps, not on Bing as a whole. Uh, you're absolutely correct that, generally speaking, one of, one of the tenets of Bing's approach is right. to try and exploit structured data and give answers uh, instead of just uh, providing links to other web pages. And in that sense, it's very well, uh, it's a very good match with, with Wolfram's approach, uh, with Wolfram Alpha approach. Um, so uh, apologies, we're doing this a little bit. Um, I, just, I just gave Conrad the, uh, the Bing homepage when, when he started his show. Um, this, is, uh, this is the new, um, the new Bing Maps site, and uh, one of the first things that, that you might notice about it is um, that, that the interaction, the, the zooming and the panning is very fluid, and uh, the reason for that is that um, this site is, is powered by Silverlight, so it's, um, uh, it's, able to use, um, it's able to use visual technologies that are, that are far beyond what you can do uh, just with, uh, with Ajax. Uh, there are a number of different sorts of, of imagery innovations in, in Bing Maps, uh, like the fact that we are, uh, we're, using, we're fusing aerial imagery into this uh, kind of SimCity-like view, 45-degree perspective. Uh, and so you see this kind of smooth uh, zooming over, over Manhattan uh, from, from whichever uh, direction you'd like. This is a live demo, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, this is a live demo. Um, we've, we've also put a lot of work recently into, into starting to really go down to the human scale uh, in mapping. And um, when we go down to the human scale on, on these sorts of streets, we, uh, we focus a lot on three-dimensional reconstruction. Uh, so this is not just, um, it's not just panoramic Ooh. imagery. Thank you. Um, oh. I mean, of course, th this is taken with, with these uh, panoramic cameras that go up and down the, up and down the, uh, the streets on cars, but we're doing a great deal of three-dimensional reconstruction. Bing, 
uh, Bing Maps or, or Virtual Earth as it used to be has a lot of history in doing uh, uh, photogrammetric computer vision, three-dimensional reconstruction uh, from images. And we've taken the same sort of approach uh, to, uh, to our human scale imagery, which is why you can kind of move around in 3D in this environment and why all of these surfaces have a real, um, have a, have a real uh, three-dimensional, sorry, I just picked a very poor place to do this, but if, like, if I click on this side, for example, we go and we zoom to that particular view. All right, uh, so the, there are a couple of different things. I, I don't want to take too much time now while we're doing our, our initial demos, but uh, the thing that I wanted to make sure and show you um, while I've got the stage is the way we've been reconceiving of, of Bing Maps, uh, not just as a, as a tool for getting uh, driving directions or searching for, uh, for some particular uh, waypoint or something, but really as a, as a surface, as, an, as a spatial environment in which you can do all sorts of other applications, in which you, because we, we envision space as, um, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to use the term platform because that's, that, that has all sorts of other implications, but as, as, let's say, a canvas or a surface on which lots of other things happen. So this is a, an application ecosystem that uh, so far we've, we've had all sorts of internal uh, use of uh, across Microsoft, including outside the, the Maps group. Uh, this, is a, this is an example of uh, um, today's front pages that's pulling from Museum uh, the front pages of all of uh, today's newspapers. So you know, all of these are, these are all front pages from, from today, uh, geolocated everywhere in the world. Uh, it's, just, it's just an example. There are many of these uh, apps. Some of them are doing things like crawling hyperlocal uh, blogs, for example, and looking at, uh, uh, looking at, at the references to particular places. Uh, some of them are, are creating uh, kind of treasure maps of destinations. You type in an address and it creates a kind of treasure map to wherever you want to go. Uh, this one was made just a couple of days after the Haiti earthquake and uh, shows uh, aerial imagery uh, both before and after the, the quake. Uh, and we, we envision this as an ecosystem that we're going to be opening up in the next, uh, in the next few months uh, to the public. Uh, and this really takes the spatial environment and turns it into a canvas that anybody can make any sort of application on, very rich, very immersive kind of environment. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So when you, when you get a, um, the starting screen of Bing, it, uh, there's a little line up in the right, make Bing your decision engine. I, and I think that's a metaphor for our panel, by the way, because it's about, all about decisions and getting answers and, and stuff like that. And maybe that's, that's the new uh, direction where search is heading at the moment. And there are niches. Google isn't that good at. So like, like Yandex, which is really one of the global players now in search uh, with $300 million revenue last year. Yeah, we have. Is it uh, is it working? Yeah, we have uh, about last year we had uh, 305 million uh, okay. revenue, and this year we increased in rubles about 13 percent, but decreased in dollars because of the exchange rate. So it's not as, <laughs> as beautiful. <laughs> a little bit. Uh, we are doing uh, generally the same as the uh, big search engines, uh, but. Uh, um, I think it's uh, very good that uh, we have uh, uh, diversification in some countries. Uh, for example, in uh, France, 97% uh, of all the searches uh, is done through Google. Maybe some people know that. And I think the similar situation in Germany and uh, uh, different in Russia. And uh, you may ask why. Uh, maybe it's because Google was neglecting Russia or Google was just not doing uh, it good. Uh, but I believe it's because of uh, there are some uh, strong players uh, in some countries, and very few countries in the world, and such, and such as Russia. Uh, we are doing search since 1989. Uh, we're doing we are in a search business, and uh, since 97 we are online. Uh, our main goal is to answer questions. Our focus audience is uh, all the Russians all over the world, so we are trying to answer. Uh, the best possible uh, question, including information and uh, understanding of queries in Russian. Uh, I think our strong points uh, are um, understanding language, understanding the linguistics, and uh, um, another thing is uh, having local information uh, that other players don't have. And sometimes we even develop uh, the whole markets. For example, uh, there is no digital map of Russia. There is no uh, free digital books or digital encyclopedias. So we, are start, uh, we started that. We, 
we created the whole market sometimes. We also develop, we're also promoting uh, internet very much. We're trying to have, uh, we're trying to promote uh, cheap internet. We're pushing uh, Wi-Fi in Moscow. We're pushing uh, um, uh, cheaper internet in regions. I just wanted to show you, uh, sometimes we, 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 we find information if we can't find, if we don't, we don't find information, we don't uh, have traffic information available in Russia. You can't just come to a city and buy it. There's no such company that produce the traffic information. So we, what we do, we uh, distribute a free ap uh, application uh, for the phone and collect this data to create a traffic map. That's what we do in Russia. Um, I, don't, I, can, I can show that impressive and beautiful pictures as the guys showed. So, <laughs> and, uh, well, that's more or less enough. I mean, yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. So, so you think Google is um, on, on its way to, to world domination, but at the end you find, for example, China or Russia and uh, some other markets very not successful. How come? I think uh, we have been, uh, we are successful in a large, uh, the large majority of the markets we are in. And I think our overall approach... Uh, Mike, please. Try it again. Uh, hello? Uh, we're successful in a large, uh, the, the vast majority of the markets we're in, and I think we generally take a, a very global approach to all we're doing. We have a very algorithmic approach to everything we do so that it internationalizes easily. And we do have specialist teams for each of these countries. So we have teams working on Russian, we have teams working on Arabic, we have teams working on German, and so on. Um, I, I mean, Competition in any country is good. It pushes us to be better. And uh, even in Russia, I think we are uh, fairly, I think Ilya will concede that we are a very respectable search engine. And one thing that we actually benefit from is kind of unexpected to me. One of the things that's complicated in Russian is morphology. We did, we have a state-of-the-art morphology system. And it turns out that Russian morphology has commonalities with uh, Arabic morphology. So as a result of doing a good morphology system in Russian, we improved our Arabic search as well. So there are lots of benefits of this sort of crosstalk between different countries. And you know, and at the end of it also, a lot of the queries within the country, countries are becoming more international themselves. A lot of the queries within the country are from people who don't necessarily speak the language of the country. There are queries in the United States in Spanish. There are queries in Germ from Germany in English. Uh, there are queries from India. A lot of the queries are in English. So that's another aspect where sort of the global aspect of Google sort of really helps. Um, I think uh, we are, we have done very respectably in almost all the markets we are in. Let's switch to politics for 20 seconds. Um, so Google announced that Google thinks about re removing its business from China due to, you know, hacking attacks and polit the political situation there. Uh, and we were talking uh, about the, the situation in Russia, which is also famous for having a rather strict government when it comes to media outlets. So I was wondering, what's your situation? Is uh, Do you have a censored index? First of all, we have a very different situation. We don't have this uh, great China firewall. Uh, we, since 90s, uh, have thousands of different um, uh, lines going out of Russia. So there is no way to block it with one switch. So th this situation currently technically is impossible, first of all. So I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense, such as Google, uh, get out of Russia because it's impossible by technical reason. You, you can, you can, well, what, what it means, it's nothing. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, the government so far does not intervene and uh, the search results are not affected at all. We are free, we are even more free in terms of search result uh, censorship uh, comparing to Europe. We don't have anything at all. Um, there was some debate in some blogs about uh, you removing uh, a popular oh, yeah, yeah. blog, that, that, blog a, ranking that's recently. A different, that's a different story. It's a, it's a story about uh, Yandex going into media business. Like Google doesn't want to be media. We don't want to be media either. We are te we are um, search engine, and we should be neutral. If we create the um, our own version of what is popular, 
not just by topics. We have topics, uh, we have topics uh, as, as Google does and, uh, and Technorati does. We have uh, topic ratings. But we used to have uh, individual blog posting ratings. And that thing is, uh, is, is not good because this way you, you sort of express your own attitude and sometimes you break the rules, you break the laws. And we don't, we don't want to create a robot or automate that will uh, filter uh, the things that are against the laws. So we just remove this rating. But we, we um, allow everyone to use the raw data. So raw data is available, and there are about 20 different ratings based on our data. OK. So let's come to, to the core search features and where they, where they are developing at the moment. So Bing is the most interesting success in this field. Um, you came out of nowhere. It's your, not your personal, but uh, I think the second huge try of Microsoft to get into the sphere, and this time it seems to work. So what are the basic success principles? Is it really getting quick answers, like I said before, or is it something different, or is it? Well, I mean, there, there are many ways of answering the question. I mean, I, th I think at, at some basic level, the biggest um, principle is just that uh, Microsoft understood that it was extremely important to compete in this space, and we put a bunch of very smart people on it. So you know that's that's the, the principle. Uh, if we want to talk about uh, you know how how Bing is uh, differentiating itself, how Bing is is uh, trying to to remake the space rather than just uh, competing in a kind of head-to-head -head way. You know, yes, it certainly is trying to do that, and there are a variety of ways. Uh, one of them, of course, is by taking a very answers-oriented approach, and what that what that means in practice is that uh, we we make a very rich. Uh, results page, and we make many different kinds of verticals that aggregate structured data feeds uh, from uh, from various kinds of, uh, of, of sources, and try to um, give you when you have when you have uh, empirical results, when you have structured data results, you try and really bring those in rather than directing you out to to go look at them. That's certainly one of the principles. So Bing is much much more playful in a way, um, and I realize that Google is also playing around a lot more than it used to. Um, so. Um, in, in former years, Marissa told us no, no additional pixel on this on this homepage, but it's changing at the moment in a very rapid, uh, very rapid way. How come? I think part of that maybe is maybe because of Bing. <laughs> I think we are really focused on the user. I mean, competition is great, and I think there are great teams at the competitive search engines, but. We really focus on the user, and I think a lot of what's driving that is that there are richer and richer media types that are becoming available. For instance, like we handle video, and like a couple of years ago, we had Universal Search, where we started integrating images and video into our results. Also, our recent feature, yes. the live search. So that's what I'm saying. So there's a new type of, of content coming around real time, right? Content, and that demands a different treatment because it's a different kind of content, and people want to look at it and treat it differently. And so you want to present it differently. And so a lot of that is driven by that, the, the nature of the media that are becoming available on the web. And social content is similar. It's a, new, it's a new type of thing that's becoming available, right? And so you want to present it appropriately for that kind of content. Are you reacting to Bing in any way? I don't believe so. I think uh, we are really focused on the user. And competition is great. It just makes everybody work harder. It's, 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 it's good for the user. It's good for us. It's good for the entire sort of search ecosystem, if you will. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, we have to, you can't look at what competitors are doing and decide what you want to do because it may be right for their users but not for yours. There may be a number of reasons why things work differently. So you have to focus on what your users want, what they need, and where things are working or not working for them in order to decide, I think, what features you work on. So when you start integrating more and more data into your basic search and giving the answer right away instead of sending people away, you're into the publishing business, aren't you? So you publish weather information, you publish the cinema programs. I, I think we do it for, for queries that have a small snippet of information that answers your, answer, uh, answers your question directly. But I think the vast majority of information needs are not like that. Like the other day, I was searching for information about, like I was trying to understand the caste system in India and, and some, about a couple of friends from different castes. It's not a small bit of information. I have to read a whole bunch of stuff. I have to sort of absorb it. And then, you know, later on, I may, you know, make a decision on some sort. I was trying to understand, you know, I live in California. What is happening with offshore drilling, oil drilling? Is it worthwhile doing? Is it not worthwhile doing? It's a complicated issue. What is actually known about the reserves and so on? Eventually, I'll make a decision. I'll vote. But that's much later after the fact, and actually, in this case, not even connected on the web. 
So I think most of our goal is to take people to the content, to the places that have the best content. In certain cases where you have like a concise answer, we'll try and provide it for them. So Blaise, what would you say? So Bing is much more radical integrating data into the search. So what, what does that do with uh, our business, like publishing information on the net? Sure. Well, the, the, weather, the weather example that, that you just brought up is an interesting one. And that's, um, by the way, you're publishing recipes. You have a yes. 300,000 items or whatever uh, recipe database. And if you look for tomato, you immediately get recommendations and you can filter down in a semantic way like uh, recipes with tomatoes and cheese and stuff like that. Exactly. Maybe Heiko can show that in the back end. Exactly. So, so things like I mean, both weather and recipes are good examples of places where a search engine can add a great deal uh, if, if reconceived, if thought about in a different way from just the kind of redirection engine, if you will, to, to the web at large. Uh, in the case of weather, uh, by aggregating lots of different weather feeds, which we do, and by presenting all of them, uh, so you, know, you can ask for, for the weather and such and such, and you'll get uh, columns, you know, what the different services predict about the weather and different, and, and one of the things you notice right away, of course, is that they're all kind of not, you know, well, not that they're all nonsense, but there's a lot of disagreement, let's say. And to see the, the variations in what, what, what different sources are predicting in the weather is in itself interesting. If they all agree it's going to be sunny, then, you know, you now are pretty sure that it really will be sunny tomorrow. But, uh, and the, the, the recipes one is also interesting because, of course, there are many websites that have, that have recipes of different sorts, but if you are looking at all of them and aggregating the information and then doing something structured and interesting, then you can do stuff like, you know, what, what are all the recipes that have, you know, tomatoes and olives in them? And, uh, and that way, you know, you, you of course do end up going to the, to the site and going to the recipe that you want, but you can do something interesting first that's going to kind of drive you uh, to, to the, the, right set of, uh, the right set of answers that you're looking for. So sometimes it's immediate structured data, sometimes it's using the structure to rearrange the data in an interesting way before redirecting you out. So I think there's room for all of these things. And I would say Google is also very much uh, starting to do this kind of stuff as well. I mean, maybe there was a classical approach in which you redirected immediately. I, for one, have certainly seen Google doing more of this sort of thing since uh, Bing began. So I, I, would, I would say it's a bit disingenuous to say there's been no response uh, whatsoever. So at least here in Germany, you have a debate about you know things like the one box. And a little example, so we are publishing some cinema websites. and. The moment the one box with the cinema program, the period of traffic broke down, so it's a real threat for some online businesses. Um, the most radical approach of you know, curating di data is World from Alpha at the moment. So how many people do suck in data and try to organize it so the, the search, oh, sorry, the information retrieval engine, whatever, can understand what I'm asking? So we have a few hundred people working on this at the moment, but we also have many people who are very keen to contribute their, their knowledge and their data and are working with us to do that, from governments to corporations. Um, everyone knows that their knowledge assets are not being used to the maximum. I think almost every large organization knows that. The question is how to use them better. And I guess our belief is very much that you can, you know, it, what, what the web has done, and, and Google in particular, and more recently Bing, is, is a fantastic job in a sense at democratizing information retrieval. You know, fantastic job. I mean, 10 years ago, one could never have imagined the job would be so well done as it is right now. But once you've got the base information, you need to work out new things from it. And most people who want to work things out, most of the time, don't have the knowledge to know all the things they want to work out from that. So what we're trying to do is add computational expertise, in a sense encode the expertise of people in the system to be able to work out results from the base information. But in order to do that, we need the base information to be appropriately curated. That's the system we have. And then we can then live produce the results and uh, you know, that involves producing actively results out. So it's a very, very different process from search and you know because the way I think about the term search search is a process and what people in the end want are answers to different kinds of queries and I guess we have a different process a computational process to produce different kinds of answers and uh, you know I see that running alongside search and the enhancements that we've we've seen to search and really making people think about the the web and you know, interacting through the web as more of a, a way to, it's, it's a bit like a research assistant. 
you know, what search does is more like a librarian. You go away and you find something that might have the right information in. What we're trying to do is get your personal research assistant to go away and get the exact answer that we hope will be right for you. Mm. There's a big debate going on, especially in the US. Um, so if Google is more and more failing in giving the right answers, especially when it comes to very popular topics, especially if it comes to topics where a lot of money is involved and you, you have all these, you know, information farms pushing, trying to push their content on the top of their search. Um, so how can you win that race? You never will win, will you? So I think this is basically what, we, I mean, the story is not new. I mean, people have been trying to spam search engines for, you know, since I've been working, and I've been at Google for 10 years, it's always been the case. But what our goal is to develop, is always we develop techniques that are resistant to that. We have launched, like I said, 500 changes, and each of those changes we measure to see that it was better than, the search engine was better than it was in the past. So search is, you know, from our internal metrics, precisely and quantitatively getting better. So there may be anecdotes of things, you know, individual queries or something that, that, that are not as good as they should be. Certainly that's the case. But overall, search gets better day after day after day. And, you know, the techniques that people develop, we develop become more and more resistant. The kinds of things that worked uh, a few years ago no longer work today. And uh, so we're constantly examining what's on the web, what provides the best information for our users, and determining what are the signals that bring up that kind of information. And you know, if we don't have those signals today, we, we, we work on getting those signals there. And frequently, we have a huge you know, state-of-the-art spam team that works on exactly getting rid of the, 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 the crap content that users don't want to see. Mm -hmm. um, later on, we'll have a panel with uh, one of the founders of Demand Media, um, uh, with Jeff Jarvis. Um, and, and this is one example also about .com or answers.com, uh, whatever, of you know, really huge content farms trying to, to publish exactly the content the search engine is, or the people in the, in, in, at search are searching for. So what does that do with, with quality of content? Do you have the feeling uh, that you have to filter these, these content farms more and more, or, or are users happy with the content they get there? So for, just to explain that in, in a second demand is, um, having something like an uh, algorithm-driven editorial office with thousands of articles per day coming out of the system designed to, to uh, get Google, Google juice. So I don't know about the, I don't want to comment on the particular details of one particular uh, site, but in general, search technically is balancing two things. There's the importance of an article and there's the relevance to your query. So in terms of, for instance, uh, the query IBM, the, most thing that, the thing that's most important is which is the site IBM, right? There is thousands of sites, there are millions of sites that mention IBM. And all of them are kind of relevant to it, but you want to pick the most important one. For a query that's more, uh, that's more elaborate, it, the, the trade-off is a bit different. And so we're constantly making that trade-off of the relevance of the information and the authoritativeness of it. And uh, if people are trying to spam us, eventually that shows up. Uh, we should see that in our uh, internal tests, and uh, we, we work on algorithms to, to get rid of that. That's, that's what we've done for 10 years. We are, we're extremely good at doing that, and we'll continue, I think, to, mm. to be the, the very best at that. Let's look to the future, because we wanted to talk about the future of search. So we were talking yesterday at the, the Champions Dinner already about are there new metaphors for searching? Could we end up having a little device like that one? I carry it around, the device knows where I am, it records the sound, it knows uh, after a year everything about my private life. And would it be possible that that's kind of recommendation engine, a real decision engine at the end, firing all the information uh, it gets out of my life? Yeah, there's no question. Uh, I mean, I, I think that um, we've been, in a way, in, um, in a bit of a, a rut about the way search is conceived for the past uh, 10 years. And I really don't mean this as disrespect to Google at all. I mean, I, I think Google made a tremendous uh, pioneering step in the way information gets accessed this way. But what's happening now is that uh, more and more we're accessing it from devices like this one, from small devices that are with you all the time. They're on and connected all the time. They have all of these sensors uh, besides uh, just the, the, in fact, the, the ability to type stuff in is in a way the weakest element of the phone. 
um, you have uh, voice, you have imagery, you have movies that you can take, you have location, compass, um, and, um, and of course you're doing all sorts of other things on your phone as well. And when you think about all of the many implicit signals that all of that gives you about what you might be uh, searching for, or what you might want, or what answers you might want, uh, it's, it's a huge amount of information. It's far greater in a way than uh, the information that I just type into the box. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, models for implicit search and for augmented reality are going to play an enormous role in uh, the next few years of the evolution. Where are the first signs on Bing, uh, on, you know, using different signals? For example, when I was in the Alps skiing, as I mentioned before, um, immediately the, the right map showed up where I, uh, in, when I went to the in, in, into the internet on, in this little hut there. So I was really astonished to see that. It's, I, I don't think Google is doing that in Germany. Um, so what other signals like lo location of the ISP, what, what other signals do you use already? Well, so if you were in the Alps uh, and, and, you, and it was uh, uh, après ski, right, and um, you typed in uh, chocolate, right, in the Alps, then, uh, of course, if you type in chocolate into, you know, either, either bing.com or google.com right now, you'll get some suggestions and you'll get some answers about you know, the Wikipedia page on chocolate and, and how it's smelted and all kinds of nonsense like this. If you type it in in that situation, you want to know where, where do I, you know, where nearby can I get hot chocolate that is open now? Uh, and, you know, ultimately, where is the line shortest and, uh, you know, what, what, are the, what are the prices of hot chocolate in different places and so on? How far away and how do I walk there? Those are the answers that you want right now, here and now. Yeah, so I think uh, the thing that I saw that was really different recently, I just got uh, an Android phone, and I have a, I have a speech recognition system in, the car, in my car that's a couple of years old, and I've got a mongrel accent, you know, it's somewhat American, somewhat Indian, so I, I don't know what it is. And when I say, you know, uh, telephone in my car, it just does something completely random, right? It'll say, give me, say, directions to some random place. And so I just completely gave up on it. And then I got this phone, I was in the car, and when you're driving, you can't, you can't type into the thing, and I needed, I needed to do a search for some, uh, some business. And it worked, and I was really kind of astonished. And so there's, one of the things that I think that's changing this whole is ability to interact with these devices in ways that we didn't conceive of before, in places we didn't conceive of before. And I think the speech recognition part of it is gonna be important in both the car as well as you know, in other locations where you can't have easy access to uh, your hands. And then you can imagine, you know, speech synthesis for producing the answer. So when you're working out and you have, you're thinking about something, you're like, well, you wonder about something. There's no easy way to do that today because you're... Let, let me add one thing. I'm going to come in from a slightly different angle. So one of the things we're very interested in is having answers that come back as applications. So we can build interactively in applications that you can actually interact with. So when you ask a query, you may not just get a dead document or a graph but something that's been built specially for you with sliders or pull downs or whatever that can actually change as uh, with what you want to do. So in a sense, we're sending back a whole application space in the future as opposed to, to just sort of the, 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 the style of graphics and, and other things that, that we're used to. So I think this sort of interface that isn't text, uh, obviously maps is a great example of where that's already gone, um, is, uh, is an important sort of direction. And I suppose what I think about in this is improving the bandwidth of communication between, if you like, the, the author, which might be the computer, and the reader, in quotes, who you really don't want to be a, a reader in, in a dead sense. You want to be somebody who really interacts with the information. And I think as we're using things on smaller screens, it becomes even more important to be able to interact in this much richer way with the information you get back. So will you ever answer the question, which car should I buy? Which car should I buy? Which car should I buy? You should, you should take public transit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so...